Hi, everybody. I'm Steve. Uh, thanks for having me here. I've always wanted to come to Poland, so this is really uh, exciting. I'm mostly Slovak ethnically, so I've been meaning to visit this part of the world for a really long time, so I'm really happy to be here. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about APIs today, um, and specifically how to design hypermedia APIs. Uh, yeah, like I said, I'm Steve. Uh, if you're not familiar with the work that I do, um, I hack on Hackity Hack. It's the easiest way to learn programming, and it teaches you programming via Ruby. Uh, I teach classes with uh, Jumpstart Labs. We teach the best Ruby and Rails classes in the world, so if anybody needs any training, uh, you know, talk to me about that. And uh, so this talk is, uh, is a talk about this, this journey I've been on for the last eight months of my life or so. Um, if you know, there's sort of this like traditional uh, tale, like American Indian, somebody wanders off to the desert on a spirit journey and like comes back all crazy-eyed and like you know has has seen the light. So this is uh, this is something that I tend to do uh, when I want to learn new things. Like I have a list um, of stuff that I would like to learn about, and any time that I feel bored or if I you know I'm ready to learn something new, I think about what's on that list and I pull something out and then I go investigate it. So this happens a lot with technical things. I'll hear people say something like oh, Rails doesn't do real rest. And so I'll say, that's interesting. I don't know why someone would say that. I'll file that away and go look at it later. And uh, so one day I decided to actually look into that. And uh, it turns out that if you read people's uh, doctoral dissertations as opposed to random people's blog posts, sometimes you learn that in fact, yes, we are in fact doing things in the wrong way. Uh, and so this is, this is my, uh, me sharing with you what I've learned about REST and how to build RESTful APIs. Um, so you may, uh, if you read my blog, you'd have seen this blog post that I did a couple days ago. But um, so you may have seen like the, the title of the talk is Hypermedia APIs, but you just said REST. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen Portlandia, um, but uh, I like it a lot. And that's why I never moved to Portland, because I will be one of those people. But basically, uh, uh, REST is sort of uh, done. Uh, I don't want to be one of those people that's, that's saying, uh, you're doing REST wrong. You know what? Like, what Rails thinks REST is, let's just leave that to be REST. We already know what that means. There's no point in arguing about terms. It's much better to like, move forward in a positive way. Instead of arguing about what a term means, we should just make a new one. So um, for various reasons, uh, the, some people in the REST community are starting to call these like, truly RESTful APIs hypermedia APIs. Um, and so when I say REST for the rest of this talk, I'm not talking about real REST, I'm talking about Rails REST. And when I talk about hypermedia APIs, I'm talking about real REST. So it's, it's a little bit strange with the terminology at first, but um, as this like, name picks up some steam, uh, it'll be a little bit easier. <laughs> O'Reilly has already published one book called Building, HTML, uh, Building Hypermedia APIs with HTML5 and Node, and it's really fantastic. Um, and so if O'Reilly publishes a book with a thing in the title, like, I feel comfortable using that term. So, uh, so from now on, real REST hypermedia APIs. Um, by the way, that book is fantastic. And uh, Node is totally incidental to the content of the book. So you should read it even if you're, you hate Node. Um, so I don't really like Node very much myself, but I love the book. So um, yeah, so no more REST, just hypermedia. So uh, let's talk about a background of what a hypermedia API actually is, since you know nothing about them, clearing your mind of all the stuff that you don't know uh, or that you know about Rails. So um, at its simplest, hypermedia uh, APIs are designed to scale better. Uh, they can be changed more easily, and they promote decoupling and encapsulation with all of the regular benefits that this stuff brings. So uh, this kind of design is the ultimate general decoupled um, API. And that's really the main benefit. Um, you know, we heard yesterday about uh, one of the metrics for software quality is your ability to withstand change over time. And so uh, if you build your APIs in this way, um, you can do uh, amazing things like changing the way that your API works on the server and you don't need to push new versions of the client, um, which sounds really insane. But um, if you think about it, um, all of this stuff is based off of the way that the World Wide Web works in the first place. It's sort of descriptive, not prescriptive. There's a little bit of prescriptive stuff in there, but most of it's descriptive. And so um, when was the last time that you had to upgrade your browser because Google did a deploy, right? You don't. Um, and a browser is a general API client that works across multiple APIs, which are websites. So. Um, if we can build our APIs in the same fashion, you can do things like, um, or you know, uh, new Twitter, for example, right? Like new Twitter and new new Twitter both totally change the way that Twitter works. 
And uh, while that's not a great example of like, you can be like new new Twitter because I hate new new Twitter, that's the idea, right? Like you didn't need to upgrade your browser to take advantage of those changes. Your interface just changed. You dealt with the new features. Um, you know, all that stuff happened without needing to update any software on the client side. So that's like the largest benefit and that comes directly out of this decoupling um, that happens when you do APIs this way. Um, however, they're not perfect. So um, that's the, the one thing. While I do think that most APIs can benefit from this, there are some that can't. So in particular, um, it's not always the best as far as latency goes. So like if you need you know, sub 10, 10 millisecond latency, then this kind of API is not for you. Um, also, uh, caching is one of the primarily way, primary ways that these APIs scale. And so uh, caching is you know, very difficult, right? There's that saying, uh, there are two hard things in computer science, <laughs> naming things, cache invalidation, and off by one errors. So uh, you know, cache invalidation is really hard, and so that's one of the things you have to be good at if you're building an API in this way. Um, also, because the, the messages are text-based, um, it will never be as efficient on a per-message basis as a binary protocol is, but usually small messages fit inside of a, you can make messages fit inside of a single TCP packet anyway, so you know, this is sort of a, something that goes back and forth, but if you build a custom binary protocol, like BSON, for example, so like MongoDB is a good example of this, other NoSQL stores use a uh, HTTP-based API, like Couch, um, but then they have text messages being sent over. Mongo uses BSON, which is a custom binary format, um, and so it's more compressed and a little bit thinner. So uh, you, know, you can't take advantage of those kinds of things if you build an API like this. So not pre uh, good for, for every situation, but I think they can be good for many of them. Um, after all, the largest computer system in the world was built this way. Um, there's kind of a, a little bit of um, what I call web worship that happens inside these circles. So you'll constantly hear people that talk about these kinds of topics being like, well, yeah, but like, if you think about the way a web browser works, right? Like I already did that once. Um, and so there's sort of this, uh, you know, almost religious reverence given to the World Wide Web. Uh, and um, there's a good reason for that. Um, if you think about, you know, Google, for example, right? There are three uh, blessed languages of Google, right? C++, Java, and Python. Well, they've started actually discouraging people from using Python because Python cannot handle the amount of load uh, that Google has. And this isn't a knock on Python, um, it's just that at the kind of massive scale that Google is dealing with, uh, you know, you can only really basically deal with C++ and Java. So um, Google accounted for 6% of the world's web traffic in 2010, right? So uh, the systems that are built in this way, the World Wide Web, are two orders of magnitude larger than Google as far as scaling is concerned and Google is the largest single entity that's built anything. So um, that's sort of the, one of the reasons why, like when, when we talk about scaling your API, um, you know, the largest information system in the planet works like this, so you should consider that before uh, denigrating it or talking down, uh, you know, just trying to remember those things. So I define uh, hypermedia APIs as any API that does these two things. The first one is use HTTP properly, with an asterisk on there. Um, the second one is using hypermedia to guide clients through the business process. Um, that's the tricky part. Um, the asterisk is because uh, this is sort of a compromise definition. You don't have to use HTTP. Uh, you can use any sort of protocol that fulfills certain requirements, but in the real world, nobody uses anything but HTTP, so I might as well just say it. Um, but that's not technically true, hence the asterisk. But, um, you know, that's the big thing, the, the main reason why Rails is not, does not do this by default is that you do number one, right? Rails is pretty good with HTTP, but um, hypermedia, people don't know what that is or don't use it for their APIs, so that's, that's the part that's number two. And uh, sort of ironically, why, why does everyone use HTTP when building these kinds of APIs, right? Like, why don't we use other protocols? And the main reason is that if you look at uh, Roy Fielding's doctoral thesis on, uh, you know, how these kind of software architectures are defined, then there are all of these uh, constraints, with the last one being optional, which is kind of fun, optional constraint. But um, so all, all of these things are what your API has to do on a protocol level in order to follow through um, you know, with this kind of stuff. The details of what they are are important and are kind of out of scope right now. And the reason for that is that if you use HTTP properly, you get all of those benefits. The only one you don't get is a sub-constraint of the uniform interface constraint called Hypermedia is the engine of application state. Uh, you may have heard of this referred to as Hadios or uh, the hypermedia constraint, um, if you've been reading my blog or other things about this topic. And so that's, that's why this is sort of defined in these two terms, is that using HTTP properly gets you almost the whole way, 
and then the last little you know checkbox is that, and it turns out that this is actually probably the, in my opinion, the most important part of all of this. It's what makes these APIs significantly different from other kinds of APIs, um, and so that's that's sort of why we call them hypermedia APIs, is because you need to use hypermedia in order to make this constraint work, and that's that's what this is really the game changer. That's what provides this level of decoupling and flexibility. So. Um, you know, yeah, using HTTP correctly, right? So we don't really do this anymore, but a long time ago, people used to get Photos 12 delete, and that would delete a photo. Um, this is obviously bad. Um, it's really unfortunate that, you know, so uh, there was some discussion yesterday about, you know, like, oh, well, the entire web is moving to thick JavaScript clients. And I sort of made a joke, you know, to myself in my head uh, that, yes, we need, to, we need to remove all of the servers and just have clients, right? Servers are irrelevant. Everything's on the client now, so no more servers, just clients. Um, so that's, that's sort of a tangent, but, like, the thing we have to remember is that, you know, you guys here at this conference are on the absolute cutting edge of your craft. Right? Think about all the programmers that don't go to conferences, that don't read blogs, that don't practice or think about you know, doing programming workouts. They don't care, they just want a paycheck. Right? Those kinds of people are the vast majority of developers, unfortunately. So you have to remember that we're sort of insular in a lot of ways, and that like, the things that we talk about best practices, a lot of people don't even know or understand. So a large amount of the web is still actually implemented this way. Um, there's a really famous story about Google made a web accelerator, um, and if everybody followed HTTP properly, this tool would be awesome. Basically, when you go to a web page, it starts prefetching all of the links off of that web page. So, uh, you know, because you read a page, it takes you a little bit of time, right? So you could prefetch all of the links, and then you'd be able to essentially browse, you know, instantly because it would just use the cache. The problem is because people do stuff like this, um, people would install the Google L accelerator, log into their Flickr account, and all of their photos would be deleted because it would prefetch all of the links, because get is supposed to be safe, um, according to the spec. So there are benefits um, to doing things this way, and um, you know, a, lot of this, a lot of the discussion around this topic seems to be very academic, but, uh, and you know, I'm like doctoral thesis, but there are actual benefits in the real world, right? Like everything that we do is in some way derived from academia and from people that give these kinds of things thought, and so um, you know, there's, there's lots of details, but uh, you know, that's important. I should really, turn up the amount of time that this takes, but whatever. So um, building an API in this way, um, how do you do it? It's the main point of my talk, right? So uh, it basically takes five steps to, to build an API like this. And uh, I think you'll find it interesting the way that this is different from how you would normally build an API. So uh, here are the five steps. First thing you need to do is evaluate your business processes uh, the second thing you need to do is create a state machine that represents those business processes. The third one is evaluate the needs for your media type. Uh, the fourth one is to create or find a media type that already exists that fulfills those uh, needs that you figured out in step three. And step five is the magic, and then implement it. Um, so what's interesting about here, about this, is that you'll notice there's sort of this, this uh, media types are really, really important. Um, and uh, you know we'll get into that a little bit more later, but also this this idea of the state machine and business processes. Um, so uh, I guess as by way of overview, if you think about a website and you think about a user browsing it, uh, that is sort of very much like a state machine, right? Every link away from the home page is a new transition. Every new page is a new state in the state machine, and you can represent your whole website as uh, this state machine with these links. So um, you know your user is sort of navigating and providing these transitions, and then you have you know the completion step of any given business process. And a lot of times, UX designers are all about removing you know, nodes in that state machine, right? So if your home page just has a splash and you have to click on a link to do anything, that adds one more step, right? Um, all the research that Amazon um, and Google did about like uh, the number of steps it takes to sign up for your application, right? Every single step you lose more and more people. So you wanna reduce steps, you can think of that as like a state machine, right? Your business process takes four steps to complete. Um, so state machines are really, really important. Uh, and that's why REST, representational state transfer, State machine, state, it's in the name. Um, but the other thing are media types. So the reason that, that you don't need to download a new version of your web browser whenever Google releases a new version of Google is because the only contract between the server and the client are knowing about how the protocol works, like HTTP, and knowing about the media type, which in this case is HTML. 
So if you design your media types correctly, then uh, you can change the, t the, the information that's actually used inside of that message, and your client will be able to render it automatically, right? That's what happens when you deploy a new version of your website. You generate new HTML, so your browser displays new stuff. So you can build clients that essentially work in the same way. Um, so there's that. Um, a wild example appears. Uh, so let's talk about this in a slightly more concrete manner. Um, I have a friend, Jamie Nesta, who is a student at the aforementioned Mendicant University, um, which is awesome. He has this website called uh, W3C Love, which is really, really cool. Uh, I've actually been meaning to, to make tests around this, but the idea is that it will spider your website, submit all of the links that it can find, up to 100 to the uh, HTML validator, and tell you if your site is valid HTML or not. So really cool, and he wanted to build an API, so he put one together that was the Rails style API, and then he said, hey Steve, you're doing all this work on API stuff, could you tell me how to make this better? And I said, sure, and I typed out this huge long thing and sent it to him, um, and we're still working on you know, getting that together, so if you look at it right now, it's still his old you know, style of API, but he's slowly moving it towards this type, so I figured I would share with you this, uh, this example of like a concrete actually building an API in this way. So let's look at the way it currently works. So right now, you send a GET request to API version one sitemaps check and then pass the URI in as a parameter, right? This makes a lot of sense. If you wanted to validate a website, you know, you would, you would make a GET request, you would send in the kind of thing you want, and it would give you a bunch of JSON back. This is the way that most Rails-style APIs work. Um, in general, you know, you get this response, it's got tons of JSON with all your information, the number of pages it counted, um, the individual pages itself, you know, when it scraped them, all that stuff. Uh, really cool. So this is the standard way that we build things. Unfortunately, there's all sorts of coupling that's happening here that you don't even think about. So if you want to build a client that's about this, you need to uh, introduce this URL into your client. So by doing that, you've created coupling between your client and your server. The client knows about the URLs that the server has. So if you want to change any of those URLs for any reason, totally broken. You have to update your client. Um, same thing with the responses, right? Uh, we were talking uh, earlier about you know, how it's, it's sort of annoying to check Okay, if I'm an admin, I have these extra attributes and I need to know what they are versus all these different roles, right? So if you're explicitly checking all the things that come back as your response, then you're adding coupling because the server or the client knows all of the uh, attributes that are going to come back. So, uh, you know, so that's kind of a problem too. And it's the same thing. Um, he also has a web pages version that will check just one single page. So there's sort of two main processes, spider my site, check this one web page. Um, and the advantage of using this one page over the whole, uh, you know, why you just send the one page to the, the uh, real validator is mostly because the multi-page thing is built on top of it, but also just because then there's sort of one, you know, one tool that you can use to, to do both things. But he has these two processes. So, um, so that's sort of what we need to do. We need to provide um, the ability to check web pages and the ability to check websites. So um, if you think about it, there's essentially these two processes, the web pages and the sitemaps. And um, now we're going to build a state machine that's, that encompasses these you know, business processes. So this is the first version I came up with. You start at the root. Um, I'm actually going to make this a little bit bigger. Yeah. So you start at the root, um, and then you would request a form for the web page API. You'd process that form, and then you'd get all the information back in the display. And the display would contain a link back to the root. Same thing with the sitemaps, right? You'd request a form. You'd fill out that form. Here's the website that I would like to you know, build with this. Um, you'd process it, that would give you the stuff, and it comes back. A really simple example, you know, I, would, I don't have very much time to tell you about this, so I could make a more complicated one. But um, then I decided to make them slightly separate, so you can sort of see the two separate processes. So this is essentially the same thing, but just with the displays slightly different. Um, either one of these are totally valid. You can come up with, you know, different kinds of state machines that represent these processes. But, um, you know, that's sort of the, the ideas, the steps that you would go through. Um, and the reason that we need this, this form step is because we need a template in our URI, right? So we need to tell it what uh, website to go check. And so we need to provide a way to do that templating of the link um, if we don't want to decouple our links to our servers. And you do that through forms, right? Same thing if you think of a form with a get, uh, you know, it's, it's a form, right? So you build those sort of things in your media types. Um, so we need to evaluate our media type needs. Um, unfortunately, JSON cannot drive your API. Um, this is one of the things about the media types. The media type has to be a hypermedia type. Uh, can anyone tell me the canonical way to make a link in JSON? You, you can't. There isn't one, right. So while you can't use JSON directly, what I mean is you can't use application JSON. That doesn't mean that you can't use JSON as a serialization format and add hypermedia semantics on top of it. So, um, 
you know, uh, you'll see a lot of the people in the, uh, you know, hypermedia community really love XML. So you'll see a lot of XML out of them. Um, but, you know, JSON also is, is equally as valid. XML by itself does not have a standard way of representing links. So you need to provide a schema that provides links or some other type on top of that. But that's the important thing is you need to develop a custom type or find a type. So, um, for example, collection plus JSON is a really great um, hypermedia type that's based on top of JSON. It provides uh, query templates, um, form elements elements and ways of representing collections with attributes and stuff. Um, and it's totally valid. So when I say you can't use JSON, I don't mean that you have to throw away and come up with some crazy new format. It's just that um, if you serve application JSON, but you add extra semantics, now you need to tell your clients like, hey, I'm going to give you some JSON with some extra stuff. And we call that extra stuff out of band information um, because it's not included with the request. So um, if you'd send, hey, I'm giving you collection plus JSON, now that information is moved into band because it's part of that media type definition. And so the, uh, the idea is that you'd be able to, com to code up a client is entirely out of just knowing the way that the media type works. Um, and that, since that's the single contract between your, your server and your client. So, um, so we in, I could use collection plus JSON, but I decided in this case I wanted to build semantics on top of JSON. So let's go through that process really quickly. So we're going to create a media type. Um, this is very much an art as well as a science. You often have to you know, go through and get it right. Um, uh, you have to try it out and you know sort of work with clients and see what things work. Um, so you know, but this is a large part of what that designing hypermedia HTMI's and H HTML5 and JSON or and Node. Ooh, too many JSONs. Um, this is a lot of what that book is about, and it's a lot of what the work that I'm doing um, is about is how to design media types effectively. But um, the two things you basically need are the data elements that you want to store. You can do this by just saying like, and here's a list of keys and values, and we'll have the data name and the data value, or you can actually specify the data types that you want. Um, those are both valid. Uh, one introduces more coupling than the other, but you know, whatever. Um, it depends on your needs. And the hypermedia controls, which are things like links and forms primarily. So um, you know, ways of connecting your representations together. So hypermedia is all about the links. The hyper is the, the links and connections. So um, in this case, I made this w3c love.validation plus JSON. Um, and uh, so it would have the media type of application vnd.w3c love.validation plus JSON. Um, the vnd is a vendor prefix. So if you have not fully standardized this type yet, you can serve stuff under the vendor tree. So vnd and then your, your name. Um, the plus JSON lets people know that like, hey, if you don't understand this media type, it still is also valid JSON. So feel free to parse it as JSON. You're just missing out on some of the semantics. So there's that. Um, so in this case, we're going to add these data elements, which are all of these individual attributes. And I sort of wrote these out. Um, now this is too big. Um, but basically, you know, like a response can contain all of these things. Um, in this case, I wanted to do it in full detail. So this adds a little tiny bit of coupling. But you know, that's the choice that I made in this particular choice. And uh, as far as controls, we need a template URIs. So we need something to do with uh, links. So I say that a response can include a forms um, element, which is an array of JSON objects. Um, they must have href, rel, and data elements. Then data will be the names and values of the things you would set. So you can see how you'd take this URI um, at the href attribute. You would um, take the data elements and turn those into the parameters that would go on the end. And that would tell you how to process um, this kind of templating. So um, yeah. So then the, uh, the, rel, it's the rel values. So if you don't know about the rel, it's the relation on links. So it sort of tells you this link means this. Um, there's a sitemap form, which will a link with that rel will give you a form for generating the quest. And the sitemap will lead you to um, information about a sitemap. And uh, so that's sort of it. Um, there's a more formal media type definition that's hard to show in presentations. So um, I actually have some, some work where I wrote all this stuff up so you can see it a little bit better. But, um, and then the magical step five is implement. So if you have that media type, you write your client so that you're able to do that work. Um, and uh, you know you make your server serve that media type. Everything's all good. Um, and of course, this is very hand wavy. Unfortunately, I only have half an hour. If we had two hours, I could show you all sorts of stuff about how to do this kind of thing. But um, this is intended to be an overview. So um, I am definitely waving my hands and not talking about these details. But that's because I'm writing a book, which I'll get to in a little bit. Um, and so as sample responses that these shows like. So if you would request. Um, you know, I want this URL, the root of the API, and I want application plus JSON. Um, it would give you back these links with the rels and the hrefs. Uh, you'll notice I did dot, dot, dot. And I haven't really talked about restful URLs. And that's because that entire concept is total bullshit. 
Um, RESTful URLs are not a thing. Um, URLs are intended to be totally opaque, and they can be whatever you want. It does not matter. That doesn't mean that it's not nice for people to design them nicely, but the idea of designing a RESTful URL is totally misguided. Um, so anyway, so uh, in order to you know, say I want to validate a website, um, then I would be able to go through those links, you know, say I parse them out into some, some Ruby, and uh, I want to find the one where the rel is the sitemap form, and I grab the href attribute out of that link, right? So find the links array, find the rel with sitemap form, grab the href attribute. A um, little bit of Ruby pseudo-ish code. And then I would request that URI to get the form. Now it would return me back a form with the href, the rel, and the data attributes. So I would need to pass in check as a parameter, put in whatever value that I want, and it would give me a URL. And basically I would grab uh, that information and submit it in the same way that it did up top. You know, find, you know, parse the response, find the link, uh, send it off. Um, and that's sort of why, again, the URLs don't necessarily matter in this kind of work, is you're always getting them from your responses. And this decouples those URLs from your servers and clients, so you can change them later. As long as the RELs maintain stable, then uh, you know, it's all good. So as a recap, um, evaluate your business process. Figure out what it is your API needs to do. That is step one. Um, step two is make a state machine that represents that business process and all of the steps therein. Uh, step three, figure out from that state machine what kinds of hypermedia things that you need. Uh, and then step four, create or figure out if an existing type is uh, useful to you. Uh, and then step five, build it. So um, I'm writing a book. Uh, I, I have literally done, I spent after, I decided to do this in a lean fashion, so I told everyone I was writing a book to see if they would be interested. Turns out you all are interested. Uh, so then I spent the next like six months reading every single thing I could possibly find about this topic. I bought every existing book that uh, almost that exists on this thing and read them all. Uh, I did a lot of searching through mailing lists, um, talking to people, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so I've collected that information and uh, I just released before this talk the alpha of my book. So you can get a designing hypermediaapis.com is very much an alpha. Um, I wanted to show what I've been working on and I plan on doing a lot more. So there's currently like 14 articles. That's the start of explaining this in full depth. Um, and I expect it to be at least three to four times longer than it currently is. But if you like getting on the ground floor of these kinds of things and you want to read more about this topic, um, you know, you can talk to me right now or send me emails. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm also writing this book. Also, uh, I made a public mailing list, which I forgot to put the URL on there, but it's hypermedia at liberalist.com, and it's for discussing all of these kinds of things in, uh, you know, your, our own way. So that's available to anybody, not just people that, that, uh, that read the book. So uh, that's it. Um, I'm at Steve Klabnik on Twitter. SteveKlabnik.com is my website. Designing Hypermedia APIs is the website for the book. And uh, one last thing I want to mention, one of the really nice things that I like about doing the work at Jumpstart is that all of our information is open source. And so if you're uh, interested in learning some stuff about Ruby and Rails, you go to tutorials.jumpstartlab.com and read um, what they're doing. Uh, a lot of the Hungry Academy work is being open sourced as well, and so some of it is going up on there as we build it. So if you're interested in what the Hungry Academy stuff is doing with uh, Living Social, then you can find out a lot of things on there. And uh, it's all on GitHub, so you can actually fork pull requests and uh, you know, change stuff if you like. And I'm really excited about that because I love open source. So thanks for uh, listening to me talk about all this stuff. And uh, yeah, I'm out of time. Versioning. Yes. Because there are some books uh, tell that it's good to put version uh, in the URI, and some, for example, like uh, Ben Ramsey or David Zulke, uh, there are advocates of putting version in media, uh, in content type feeder. What, what, right. What's so um, I wrote about this before, and um, I was wrong. <laughs> about it. Uh, I re redacted what I put on my blog, or I didn't redact it, but I said I think this is wrong. It turns out that versioning is an anti pattern. Um, you'll hear people constantly say, use the right tool for the job, use the right tool for the job, use the right tool for the job. And then you say, I need to manage change in my application. And they say, cool, we'll version it. 
And it turns out that versioning is only one way of actually managing change. Um, and the problem with versioning is that it introduces lots of coupling because you're versioning based on you know, certain things. So uh, hypermedia APIs manage change by being flexible in their media definition type and also allowing for um, extensibility. So uh, you're free to add new information and clients will uh, essentially ignore it. Um, and if you plan on deprecating something, um, you know, that can sort of be done. Uh, but you would need to notify your clients that you're deprecating it anyway, regardless of whether you are changing a version or not. Um, and so it turns out that versioning is essentially uh, totally a red herring and just not the way that you build these kinds of things. Um, if you think about, uh, you're like, that sounds kind of crazy. Think about how long um, HTML4, uh, right, 1998, and we're still not done standardizing HTML5. So you know you, that media type has lasted us like 12 years without undergoing significant major changes. Um, and actually, after HTML5, um, HTML is not going to be versioned anymore. It's only going to be HTML with no number. So um, there's a lot, and that's a very deep topic, and it's actually the next thing that I'm writing. I put up the versioning as an anti-pattern, and that's what I plan on talking about, because it's definitely a big question. But um, that's the short answer. Uh, that's as short as I can make it, essentially. So the answer is do not version at all, yes? Yes. <laughs> and so... <laughs> What about if you want to let the clients to fall back, for example, to your earlier made the page? Yeah. Uh, so the uh, the thing is, is that it's about the flexibility, right? So if you uh, you can change certain things and you can't change others. So like if you keep your URLs stable, you're allowed to change the URLs and where they point. Um, and so if you want a client to fall back, you can tell new clients like, hey, this attribute is deprecated, so we're going to continue to return it in our response, but I'd prefer that you use this new one if it exists. And when new clients are built, they will use the new one instead of the old one and totally ignore it. So you can provide both at the same time, and old clients and new clients work simultaneously. So that's... Again, we could talk about this for hours, but that's the, that's the short answer to that thing. So. All right. Thank you very much. Yep.